We have partnered with the University of Utah to conduct this long COVID and post viral syndromes echo. Today, we are going to be hearing from Dr. Laura Pace, who will be presenting on post viral GI disruption. Um, I think we all can say that we've seen a lot of that going on, and I look forward to uh, learning a little bit more about that. She is the founder of Metrodora Institute, which focuses on neuroimmune access disorders. She's a leading neurogastroenterologist and is board certified from the American Board of Internal Medicine in Internal Medicine and Gastroenterology and from the United Council of Neurologic Subspecialties and Autonomic Disorders. She's been a leader in the rare disease space for many years and has served as the adult lead for the NIH Undiagnosed Diseases Network medical board member for the Dysautonomy International and chair of the Gastrointestinal Working Group for the Ehlers-Danlos Society. To say the least, Dr. Pace is very educated and we are really excited to have her here today. I'm going to turn the time over to Dr. Pace and Sarah Day um, to present on our polling questions to get started. Can acute viral infections lead to long-term gastrointestinal motility disorders? Okay, I'm glad everybody recognizes it. Seems like gastroenterologists don't recognize it, and I don't know why. <laughs> the second one is, can acute viral infections trigger long-term immunological complications, such as new onset allergies? Again, gastroenterologists miss this all the time. And then lastly, is a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome or IBS appropriate for a person with a known post-viral syndrome? Okay, so the answer really is no. Um, we see a lot of these patients carry this diagnosis and it's not appropriate. It means we haven't identified the underlying mechanism and we're gonna talk about some of those mechanisms today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So um, I, I have a few disclosures. And then the last one really is there's no FDA approved therapeutics in this clinical space. And these recommendations are based on clinical expertise of post-infectious disorders um, for which I managed long before COVID. So some of the key concepts we're gonna talk about today is this integral relationship between the nervous immune and endocrine systems that are, that's appropriate for uh, maintaining physiological homeostasis, and that within tissues, neurons, immune, and en endocrine cells are in close physical proximity, which means they're signaling to each other. And we have to think about the implications for this in our patients that have underlying connective tissue disorders. And then the last thing is that there's bidirectional communication between neurons, immune, and endocrine cells. And this becomes really important when we think about some of these complex processes that evolve in post-infectious conditions. So post-viral gastrointestinal symptoms, there's not a lot out there. There's been a number of papers published, but really it's just observational and they're early, right? So it's estimated that 25% of people with long COVID are experiencing gastrointestinal symptoms. I would argue it's probably much higher than that, and it's going to continue to get higher, unfortunately. The things that we're seeing are like nausea, headache, cognitive changes, rhinorrhea. This can be with and without eating oral tingling, burning, dry mouth. Um, you can also have dysphagia, belching, abdominal pain, abdominal bloating, early satiety, constipation, straining with defecation or diarrhea. And it really depends on which area the gastrointestinal tract is involved. And then people are starting to report, um, as they do, adverse reactions to foods. They're also starting to get more systemic complications like flushing, urticaria, and rash. And these are symptoms that are driven by disturbances in this neuroimmune axis. And so one thing that I want to remind everybody of today is early on symptoms can be mild. Like it can be just like a little bit of bothersome nausea or dyspepsia, but these can get more severe as the um, condition progresses. And so these symptoms will evolve over time. And so new or progressive symptoms warrant re-evaluation. So it, even if you sent your patient six months ago to a gastroenterologist and they didn't find anything, but they have new or progressive symptoms, they've got to come back to us. So I'm going to start by defining the neuroimmune access really quickly. 
So this is the neuroanatomy of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, I'm hoping that most of us on this call know are aware of the autonomic nervous system and the fact that it innervates basically every component of our body and regulates all the processes that we never think about until something goes wrong. And then I would argue that's all we think about. Um, and then a component of that is the enteric nervous system, which is this specialized uh, nervous system of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but this really is a, a component of the autonomic nervous system and should not really be thought of as a separate entity. There are some reflexes that can occur within the enteric nervous system, um, but really it's all modulated by the autonomic nervous system. And so this slide is really just to highlight the fact that the enteric nervous system is um, creates like a mesh-like network that extends the length of the gastrointestinal tract and controls everything from motility to secretions to intestinal barrier function to um, our relationship with our immune system to our relationship with the outside environment, including the microbiota. It also regulates um, how we uh, absorb nutrients and water across the um, epithelial barrier. And so really the functions of the gastrointestinal tract, if we think about them in really simplistic terms, it's really food processing and then nutrient and water absorption, and then a component of waste storage um, and stool formation. I just want to remind everybody, you can live without your colon. And so even though this is where the most of the microbes reside, it's actually not where the most important interactions actually exist. Um, on the right side of the slide is just sort of the estimates for microbial load. And it's just all the microbiota studies have been focused on stool or the colon, and it's really, we're missing a main target of um, studying the interactions within the small intestine. Because this is really where these important interactions are occurring um, for mucosal barrier regulation, immune training, and neuroimmune access communication. And these are the um, processes that are disrupted in these uh, post-viral uh, conditions and cause these progressive um, dysfunction of gastrointestinal um, uh, basic functions that we need to live. This is just a cross section um, to remind us all that the outside environment truly is within the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, but then we have two different muscle layers and we have um, two different um, uh, uh, plexus of um, nerves, the myenteric and the submucosal plexus, which is really important for um, uh, regulating all these functions. And they are directly innervated by the extrinsic autonomic nervous system, um, but the extrinsic autonomic nervous system is also terminating on all the other cells and structures um, within the gastrointestinal tract and bypasses some of these, um, these plexi. This is that critical interface that we're talking about at the um, epithelial layer. You have the outside environment with the microbes, you have a mucin layer, um, and then you have a single epithelial layer. You have enteroendocrine cells um, dispersed throughout. You have a number of um, immune um, uh, signaling um, complexes that exist and are communicating with these specialized enteroendocrine cells. You also have um, the submucosal plexus, myenteric plexus, which is between the two muscle layers. So you have a lot going on here and you have um, a lot of opportunities for things to be disrupted when you have a post-viral syndrome. So just to give you a few examples, um, this is uh, one of the ways that motility in the gastrointestinal tract is actually regulated by um, the immune system. So you have these resident muscularis macrophages, which are specialized immune cells within the tissue. They're actually releasing a um, factor that is um, recognized by enteric neurons. Um, and this is actually controlling motility. In turn, the enteric neurons um, release a colony stimulating factor that help with the survival of these muscularis macrophages. So if we have disruption in the function of the enteric nervous system or autonomic nervous system, you can actually disrupt this signaling and it, which can lead over time to loss of these muscularis macrophages, which then can actually impair uh, motility. And then um, with norepinephrine signaling from extrinsic sympathetic neurons directly to these muscularis macrophages within the tissue of the gastrointestinal tract, there are, it actually signals uh, to the muscularis macrophages to release polyamines, which actually are protective to enteric neurons. And during infection, this is actually disrupted um, and you can have now loss of enteric neurons. And so over time, you can have really progressive um, gastrointestinal motility dysfunction, barrier dysfunction occurring, 
while the example from this publication is related to bacteria, this is also occurring um, for viral infections as well. And so this is why it's really important when we think about the time course for these conditions that at first you don't have um, enteric neuron uh, loss, but over time you may. And so you're going to see significant progression in dysregulation of gastrointestinal functions. The other thing that's really important is that mast cell um, uh, disorders are really common in uh, individuals with autonomic nervous system disorders and um, other post-infectious uh, conditions. They tend to crop up over time and they tend to again be progressive. And so you have this really close uh, interaction between uh, neurons and the mast cells where you can generate this feed forward cycle of um, mast cell degranulation which releases a number of mediators that are feeding back to these neurons, which then are releasing um, uh, neurotransmitters and neuropeptides and communicating with the mast cells and furthering degranulation. It's important to note, while just histamine, serotonin, and tryptase are shown on this slide, they release hundreds of mediators, including uh, a lot of proteases. So then you start to see further tissue degradation and you, see, you uh, start to experience further tissue level uh, dysregulation or dysfunction. And so then the other piece that happens is when people don't feel well, they don't eat well, when our motility changes, um, our, our, our microbes that reside there are going to also change. And so all these things dictate the um, environmental community of the, um, for the microbiota. And so it's going to have an impact on both the, the nervous, the immune, and the endocrine systems. And they're doing this and having local effects, um, but also distant effects. And we have to think about this when we think about symptoms that are um, related to gastrointestinal dysfunction. It's not just going to be your gastrointestinal symptoms. It's going to be um, uh, peripheral and central symptoms as well. And so that's why we have to think about it when patients um, are having a lot more headaches, um, a lot more fatigue, uh, cognitive impairment that the microbes could actually be playing a role and the driver could be dysfunction at the level of the gastrointestinal tract. These microbes are secreting um, substances that are entering the bloodstream and traveling all the way to the CNS. They're also directly activating enteroendocrine cells. This is a newly discovered type of enteroendocrine cell called a neuropod. They're actually are directing, directly synapsing with the ENS and the ANS which then again is communicating with the CNS. And so again, you can have um, system-wide symptoms related to GI dysfunction. Microbes are also activating enteroendocrine cells, which then are releasing hormones that both have local and distant effects. And then microbes are directly influencing function um, through inflammation, and this is impacting the ENS, the ANS, and the CNS. So again, systemic symptoms, the driver can be dysfunction at the level of the gastrointestinal tract. So really, if we start to think about these as neuroimmune access disorders rather than just gastrointestinal disorders, it's a really systems biology way of thinking about these complex conditions, which is going to help us accelerate research in this space and clinical care. But it's also going to require the next generation of tools uh, to make a diagnosis. And so those I'm going to talk about today. So it really does leading edge diagnostic tools. And so um, a specialist referral is absolutely required because these can't be done in the primary care setting or within uh, other sp uh, specialist domains just because of the way the procedures are done. So I'm going to briefly talk about next generation motility testing, and I think this is really important. This is a wireless smart um, wireless motility capsule called the Smart Pill. This actually measures gastric emptying, uh, transit time through the small intestine, and transit time through the colon, and then also gives you whole gut motility. And the reason this is important is that this moves beyond just the simplistic gastric emptying studies, because a lot of times those are actually normal in our patients, and it's really the small intestine um, that is impacted. And so um, just to give you a little bit of um, point of reference and how to look at this study, um, on the x-axis is time. Um, the blue line indicates temperature. So this is when the capsule is ingested um, by the person and then um, it, when it's excreted. Uh, the green line um, represents pH. This helps us understand where in the intestine is the capsule. And so you have the lowest pH within the stomach. You have an abrupt rise when it hits the small intestine. And then the pH uh, continues to increase until there's an abrupt decline um, when it's dropped into the cecum of the colon. Um, the red lines at the bottom indicate intraluminal pressure measurements, so against the um, capsule. 
And so um, this case illustrates something that's really important. So this is a young woman who was told by her physicians that she should absolutely be eating because her gastric emptying study was normal, but yet she was failing to thrive and needed to be on TPN. And um, when we did this study, we, we proved that she technically uh, meets criteria for intestinal failure. And so this is a young woman with POTS and EDS and MCAS. It's not exactly uh, um, clear for her what her trigger was, but this illustrates that her gastric emptying was actually on the rapid side, but her small intestinal transit time was greater than 16 hours where the upper limits of normal are six. And her clonic transit times um, were well over 100 hours when the upper limits of normal are 59. This person has massive gastrointestinal uh, motility uh, dysfunction and could not um, get adequate nutrition enterally and did need to be on TPM. So how can we actually diagnose this so these patients aren't lingering and being told they have conditions like irritable bowel syndrome or a factitious disorder? Well, we can do better than just taking mucosal biopsy samples because that's not going to help us understand whether in the deep layers we have an injury to the submucosal or myenteric plexus or we have immune infiltration. And so endoscopically now we can take actually full thickness biopsies and do a full assessment, look for neuropathies. We can do deep tissue immune profiling. It's going to help us come up with targets. Um, and so these, these technologies exist and we need to be doing it in these patient populations because in my experience, they actually only continue to get worse. And the goal is to actually recognize them earlier, intervene earlier so that it doesn't progress uh, to this degree. And so um, this, again, this tissue level immune profiling is helping us understand um, what might be therapeutic uh, targets. And this is an example. These were not done endoscopically, but these are from full thickness biopsies uh, in the small intestine of someone who had a diagnosis of chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction, which is intestinal failure. And what you can see in the controls, um, the darkly stained brown area is the myenteric plexus. But you can see in the cases that have intestinal failure, you have very significant loss of the myenteric plexus. So this is a true neuropathy. You also, um, in the bottom panels, you can see in the controls, there's no little brown dots. In um, the cases, and at higher magnification, the brown dots are mast cells. They also found in these patients, they had infiltration of lymphocytes and eosinophils as well. And what we don't know is the natural history of this. Does the immune infiltration come first and drive the neuropathy, or does it come second as a consequence of the neuropathy? And these are things we absolutely have to understand because it's going to help us in, in treating our patients. Then I'm going to briefly just talk about irritable bowel syndrome. It's a pet peeve of mine. It's not a diagnosis. It's a categorization and means we don't understand the biology, but it's actually a very... Um, significant condition. 50% of individuals with a diagnosis of IBS actually contemplate suicide. This isn't benign, and we can do a lot better in diagnosing uh, these patients. For example, we can start to diagnose non-IgE-mediated allergies within the gastrointestinal tract using a technology called confocal laser endomicroscopy. This in real time can tell us what food, foods, antigens, excipients, and medications people are reacting to. It's a simple test. You actually inject the person with fluorescein. It highlights the epithelial cells lining the gastrointestinal tract. And in a person where there's no reaction, it'll stay within the individual epithelial cells and not be released into the lumen. However, if you put an antigen that they're reacting to, you actually have will have immediate rupture of the cells and release of uh, the fluorescein into the lumen. So in real time, we can actually detect which aller which uh, foods or other antigens um, uh, people are expo ex being exposed to and reacting to. The other point I want to make is that this um, epithelial disruption is not detected by standard um, H&E stains, and so it's something we're missing when we're doing routine endoscopy and not implementing these next-generation uh, diagnostic tools. In this one study, this just talks about it, that um, they found that 70% of people in their population that had a diagnosis of IBS actually had a non-IgE-mediated food allergy. And so I think this is really important because this allows us to um, truly prescribe prescriptive diets. And I think it's really important that we address these early on because, again, when you think back to that neuron mast cell interaction, if you have continuous degranulation of these immune cells or activation of these immune cells, you're going to have progression of conditions. 
And so we really have to improve the diagnosis, um, I think, through discovering the mechanism of dysfunction. This is going to expand our therapeutic options and going to move us way beyond symptomatic management for these patients, which I think, think is absolutely essential um, for uh, altering the natural history of these conditions. So I'm just going to conclude with gastrointestinal symptoms are super common in post-viral disorders. They're disorders of the neuroimmune access. They're going to be progressive over time if we don't actually get this dysfunction under control, and a specialist referral is absolutely required. But your specialist also has to be a good partner. They need to be leveraging leading technologies to improve diagnostics because this is going to inform therapeutics for these conditions. And I really believe that early recognition through diagnosis and targeted interventions are essential to improve patient outcomes. And these are just some references. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat box, and I'm going to open that up um, more broadly. So if you have any questions, feel free to use the raise hand option or type them in the chat box. This is from Dr. Brown. What is the risk of perforation in these patients with full thickness biopsies? Yeah, it's a great question. Actually, we're intentionally making a perforation. Um, and so we're actually, the way the device works is you actually suck the full thickness um, of the wall, gastrointestinal wall into a device, close it off, and then um, actually uh, remove the tissue. And so you've already you've already kind of closed off the defect before you've made it. They're actually incredibly safe. People are using these already for um, resection of large polyps and things like that. So it's it's actually very safe and it's a lot less risky for our patients than having them have to get like a laparoscopic full thickness biopsy of the intestine. The next question, does the SMART pill change the diagnostic standard of GI motility disorders? You know, I, I didn't go into a ton of detail for this, but I think, yes, it does. And the reason is, is that so many patients, their the extent of their evaluation for a gastrointestinal motility disorder ends with a, like a nuclear medicine gastric emptying study. But we're actually failing to assess the small intestine and the colon where people are having so many complications and alterations in motility. This, the gold standard for looking at small intestinal or um, colonic uh, motility are something like their um, internal catheters, the manometry catheters that are really difficult to use. There's only a, a few specialized centers um, that actually can offer that technology. And one of the papers that I presented actually proved that it no longer should be the gold standard because um, it actually can't differentiate between neuropathic and myopathic disorders, which was the reason why people actually thought it should be the gold standard. So really, I think the smart pill is inexpensive. It's easy to use. It's patient friendly. It gives us a lot more information. And really all we need to know in these patients is that there is a dysfunction because then we have to go after what is the driver of the dysfunction. And so I really think it's a game changer. It is not going to solve um, us looking at esophageal motility disorders or pelvic floor like anal rectal. Those are separate modalities, but it's not what it's meant to replace. Um, but I think it's a very powerful tool. Thank you. When you detect slow small intestine transit time in patients without full failure to thrive or needs for TPN, what types of other therapies might you try to employ? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, so, and that's why I talked about the um, uh, non-IgE mediated allergies. What I'm hoping is that we can start to address some of these earlier signs that there is dysfunction, treat them very aggressively by, by actually doing prescriptive elimination diets so that we prevent the long-term complications of, you know, intestinal failure. But it, but if the problem I found is that a lot of these patients actually linger for so long that it's so progressive that oftentimes it's too late at that point. So we just need to be really cognizant of it. And that's why I think groups like this are fabulous because we're looking out for these things and trying to do early aggressive interventions so that we can prevent those long-term complications. Are there good resources for gut my microbia testing and tracking? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I would say no, because the science isn't there. The reason is, is that 99% of all uh, studies looking at the human gastrointestinal microbiota have been done on stool. 
um, that for the ones that haven't been done in stool, they've been done in the colon. And we know I have data that I haven't published yet, but I have to. And there's other data from like um, other non-human primates that shows that the stool and the colon microbiota is not a good proxy for the small intestinal microbiota. And so unless you're actually looking at the direct source, there's no point in evaluating it. Um, the, there are a couple other points I'd like to make is that I know people are really interested in this and oftentimes patients get referred for like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth evaluation. This is looking at changes um, in um, gas production from the microbes. But again, it's just telling you that something's wrong. It's not telling you the mechanism of dysfunction. And I think there's a lot of risk with treating um, SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with repeated courses of antibiotics because you're not actually addressing the underlying biological driver of the dysfunction. You're, you're addressing a consequence of it. And there are, there's some really uh, interesting emerging data showing that we shouldn't be like willy-nilly um, uh, mo like modifying the gastrointestinal microbiota because of that microbiota neuroimmune access and the, the longer term and systemic implications for those changes. There are two other questions that I'm going to ask Dr. Bateman and then um, Jen Bell to unmute and ask it on, on their own. But I want to before we get to those, because this is kind of leading into those questions, can you talk a little bit more about what the general provider audience might be seeing from patients? What are patients saying um, after these post-viral infections or maybe even just non-post-viral? What is that symptom presentation? What might they be hearing to kind of cue them that they should start looking at, at this a little bit further or in a different lens? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think it's a kind of a hard to answer in some ways. And the point that I tried to make is that the gastrointestinal tract can be a driver of a lot of the neuroimmune dysfunction that we're seeing in these complex patients. And they don't always have a primary phenotype that's so obvious, obviously localized to the gastrointestinal tract. So we really just have to be thinking about this in patients that have um, like multi-organ or multi-system disorders and start to ask them questions that may clue us in. And one of them really is thinking about these other immune-mediated conditions that may be mast cell driven. There may be other drivers to it um, from the immune system. And then, you know, looking for other uh, signals of autoimmune conditions, auto-inflammatory conditions, and then start to look if there's anything that we can modify within you know, their diet or their regimen and how they eat um, that may actually stop um, kind of contributing to that feed forward cycle that kind of gets dysregulated. And so that's why I put on the list of symptoms. I mean, it can be something as, you know, non-GI related as a headache, right? But I mean, we have to start thinking about these things because they, we, we know that there are central effects to um, GI dysfunction. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Dr. Bateman, would you mind unmuting? Yeah, I don't know if there's an easy answer to this, but I'm um, consulting on a really severely ill long COVID patient who meets criteria for MAE CFS as well. Um, and she's now to the point, she's wearing sunglasses and ear, uh, uh, you know, ear, earphones. And, but a lot of this is GI mediated. And um, when she even drinks water or eats or takes anything, it triggers the symptoms and it also triggers abdominal pain and discomfort. So she's lost a lot of weight. Um, she's kind of failed most mast cell activation uh, attempts. I just wondered if you had any thoughts. Yeah, these are really hard cases, but I mean, I, I think so. It's, it may not be a primary driver of mast cell, but it may actually be direct like auto, like immune mediated activation of the enteric and autonomic nerves within the gastrointestinal tract, creating those symptoms. You know, the ideal would be to do um, deep tissue immune profiling, also looking for um, autoantibodies. I am interested in whether we're going to see a signal with like um, some of the new autoantibodies that are being identified for systemic pain syndromes like FGFR3. They may be playing a role, and but I really think that we have to be thinking about using immune modulators kind of earlier in these more severe cases 
we just, we kind of need this signal about what to actually use. And so you just, you really need the right tests, unfortunately, and they're hard to come by. Thank you. Um, Jen, do you mind? Nope. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I, I um, have a 31-year-old patient who's a new patient to us at uh, the BHC, and um, she's not long COVID, but she had a two-year course of an active, untreated Giardia illness um, in 2017 to 19, and her course of decline is, is very consistent with that possibly being the trigger. She's pretty severely meets the criteria for ME, and she has POTS. Um, I'm still sort of figuring out whether how much of MCAS is playing a role from what I can tell, but it's, it's hard to know. But she's having increasing GI symptoms, particularly constipation. And she and I have been talking recently that we need to be focusing on her gut <laughs> and more. And um, I'm not really sure where to go with that. Um, so, you know, didn't know what your thoughts on and how, who I, who I should refer her to, or um, Steve, you're saying these tests are specialized and um, certainly I don't have access to them. Right. No, I think it's a great question. And unfortunately, um, I think a lot of these evaluations really should be done in parallel because even if they have, you know, mast cell activation to some degree, they may have a lot of other dysfunction that we need to target as well. And I really feel like, especially for these severe cases, if we kind of do it in a stepwise fashion or piecemeal it, we're kind of missing an opportunity to change the, the trajectory of these conditions. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's really hard to get a good workup um, for some of these patients. Um, even getting mast cell stains from um, gastrointestinal mucosal biopsies is a battle for a lot of gastroenterologists who want to be good partners um, for their patients and, and referring providers. It, it's kind of a hard space to be in right now as a gastroenterologist because we have so many tools available to us, but they're not being leveraged. Okay, this is from Dr. Yellman. Many of my post-viral patients also have extended histories of endometriosis. Could you comment on some of your experience with noting endometriosis and its contributions to the whole GI symptom presentation in a new patient? Yeah, again, another great question. It's a super common finding. Um, you know, the other thing is that, you know, overwhelming in, in my clinic is that the great majority of these individuals affected are uh, female. And so um, a lot of them do actually report really profound endometriosis. Um, we still don't know a ton about what endometriosis truly is. Um, it, it's, there's obviously some inflammatory component to it, potentially a neuroinflammatory component. Um, and so it's a common comorbid condition. I, it, we really just need more research in this space to understand that biological sex effect. Okay. And do you find that addressing evacuation disorders improves small bowel function in transit, or is the issue higher up in the chain usually? I mean, could addressing evacuation disorders reduce inflammation in the small bowel? So, you know, I think it's really important that we don't think about these areas of the GI tract in isolation. And I think any way that we can kind of improve symptomatology or function in our patients is super important and we should take the opportunity to do that. So if you really can adequately address an evacuation disorder, I think it is really important. As part of um, the enteric nervous system are some of these sort of like feedback loops, right? And so if someone is um, incredibly constipated, it actually does slow down for gut motility. And so it is going to contribute to differences in function. And so we do need to be addressing all of these pieces together. I would be surprised if it was um, the end-all be-all solution um, for the overall problem, because what led to the pelvic floor dysfunction in the first place? Um, and so, but, you know, there are going to be those rare cases where this is sort of the one thing you need to do. Um, but you may need to do other types of interventions while you're deal addressing the pelvic floor issue, like, like treating the um, inflammation within the small intestine. So you kind of do it all at once. So you kind of stop the inflammatory processes in their tracks and kind of reset the system um, and then kind of move forward. And, and then if you have the evacuation disorder not recur, you may be able to back off of some of those um, immune therapies. Uh, great presentation. Thanks for doing this. Um, I think it's fascinating. Um, my favorite organ, the lung, is also interesting, like the gut. 
in the sense that it has to interact with the outside world a lot, but it also has to defend us. And I think it's fascinating sort of that interplay between immune response and not overzealous or underzealous. Um, any thoughts um, on parallel um, conditions such as like narcolepsy, for example, after H1N1, they showed specific targeting of those orexin um, secreting uh, neurons uh, that were depleted after H1N1 infection. It, is this sort of a selective immune or, uh, immune response then leading to a deficiency in those types of neurons? Those, the slides, the standings you showed me uh, looked a lot like what they'd shown after those, you know, obviously viral infection. So I don't know if they've looked at that. Yeah, I'm actually not aware of that literature, but that's actually really interesting. I mean, we're definitely seeing it. And I think it depends on which component of the immune system got activated and where it decides to um, focus its attention, what you're going to have as your outcome. Um, so it's entirely possible. We won't know specifically related to COVID for quite some time until we start to, to really investigate it. And I think there's going to be different phenotypes that emerge, and some of them are kind of like that um, uh, hypersensitivity pain phenotype. Some are primarily like GI motility phenotype. Some are really like um, kind of immune auto-inflammatory type phenotype. Like I think there's going to be different phenotypes that arise. But again, one would think that if in like the case of the H1N1, if they had known that um, early on, they could have potentially put an immune modulator to prevent that attack and loss of, of neurons. So then you don't have progression of disease. And that's what I'm hoping this opportunity with COVID affords us is to really be proactive. We've been seeing these conditions. We kind of know the patterns, you know, let's be proactive and figure out what therapeutics to implement earlier on. So our patients don't end up in that same space. Thank you. A couple more questions. This is clearly a very needed topic, so thank you for your time. Um, Dr. Bateman asked, can you share your insights and advice about probiotics and prebiotics? Yeah, I get questions like that all the time. And again, I'm just going to go back to the data is not there, right? And I think that um, altering the microbiota without having objective reasons to do so, ways to track it, I think is dangerous. And I think that we're gonna we're gonna have longer term implications that we don't understand. I really think we have to be more um, you know, we have to we have to hold these gastrointestinal microbiota studies to higher standards. We have to be looking at the interface that matters, and that's within the small intestine, and they're not doing it. And they've spent, hundreds of millions of dollars on these types of studies, and we still don't know the answer to this question, that is, that's a waste, right? And so um, I, I always, I think that emerging data suggests that we should be, in general, all of us, whether we're sick or healthy, reducing the consumption of processed foods in our diet, reducing uh, consumptions of additives, emulsifiers, um, and, and things like that, because there is a signal that the way that our food is processed um, is actually contributing to this rise in these immune-mediated conditions that we're seeing kind of broadly, not just in this space. And th there's definitely um, data that shows at the single cell level that this is impacting um, the you know, intestinal barrier function, immune function within the gastrointestinal tract, and so it's risky there. So I would say Rather than doing um, pre or probiotics, I would do I would focus on really healthy diet that eliminates some of those additives that I think place us at risk um, for impairing like gastrointestinal barrier function. Thank you, Dr. Yellman. Would you mind unmuting and asking your question? I actually want to ask two questions. One's a follow up to Dr. Bateman's about altering the the gut microbiota. Um, do you see stool transplants similarly to pre and probiotics as far as altering gut microbiota, or might it have some additional um, immune mediating effects in the long run and be something that gets looked at later for these functional GI disorders? Yeah, so it's a great question. Actually, I love to get this question. So um, uh, just again, to recap, the microbiota in the stool is not even a proxy for the colonic mucosal microbiota, and it's absolutely not at all similar to the microbiota within the small intestine. And so if we want to treat a small intestinal process, 
why the heck would we take stool, like a, you know, a, a, a microbial uh, community structure that shouldn't be there in the first place and put it there? Like, we should never do that. Um, I do think there's a lot of utility for um, fecal microbiota transplants, like in, infections in C. diff, where it's just that you, you have to outcompete the pathogenic organism. For these other conditions, the ideal would be to determine what is a healthy microbial community that belongs in the small intestine, has the full complement of um, a microbial um, metabolic pathways, things like that, um, and, and actually transplant that community to another small intestine. However, that's going to get tricky too. Um, there was a paper recently published that showed that um, our microbiota actually is evolving with us over time. And so again, because of that immune training piece, even if we have all the right metabolic pathways, we may actually have a secondary compound in a microbial community that our immune system is, is recognizing that was fine with the other host, but is not fine with us as a host. It, it's actually really complicated biology. And so I think in theory, it's a great idea, but I would take out the fecal part and I would do more like microbiota, like community transplant and start thinking about that conceptually. My other question was unrelated and previously conceptualized, which was just that a lot of my patients um, have started having pretty good responses to diamine oxidase, which I understand is really trying to reduce histamine intake in your food and your medications, et cetera. I'm just curious if you could comment on the difference between you know, histamine that's, that's taken in in your food versus that that's released from a mast cell reacting to something you ingest and, and how you see those either as separate processes or part of the same process? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's um, separate processes. So, you know, the histamine that we're ingesting with our food, those are mostly hitting um, the receptors that are on cells that are meant to actually receive histamine from the lumen, right? Um, you're, and then you're getting um, very local effects uh, wherever the food is until that histamine is degraded. I actually don't know the stability of histamine for pH. Like, I don't know how stable it is at a super low pH. Um, but with the mast cells in the tissue in close approximation to nerve fibers, if you're having release of uh, components from those mast cells and they're activating the close proximity uh, nerve fibers, you immediately are starting to, a cascade of something that is no longer just having a local effect. And so I, I think they're two important things to consider, but they probably play slightly different, but kind of overlapping roles. Thank you. Since the new generation testing is limited, is there any role in empiric therapy? We're kind of touching on that just a little bit with Dr. Yellman's question. You mentioned healthy diet. Is there anything else to recommend if the index for suspicion is high? Um, index for suspicion of what? Like for gastrointestinal dysfunction? Okay. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, I, I would start to implement a diet that reduces processed foods, which is actually really hard sometimes when people have a lot of nausea or, or you know, slow motility. They tend to go towards highly processed, simple carbohydrates. I would try to find alternatives to that if you can. If they have obvious food triggers, and sometimes it's actually a combination of foods or amounts of certain foods, it gets really hard to tease apart. I would have them remove those um, those foods, if if they if there is a clear signal, um, and then I would I th I don't think there's any harm really in starting like an empiric trial of kind of aggressive mast cell targeted um, medications uh, early on and and see if that can help. So when you say that, are you talking like gastrochrom? Yeah. So I mean, I usually I'll do um, like a. H2 blocker and, you know, two to three times a day, um, I will use um, oral chromalin. And I have noticed that the way that that is formulated can actually impact how people tolerate it. And again, it may be like an excipient in the medication that they're actually reacting to and not the chromalin. So then that decreases their tolerability. Um, and, um, you know, a leukotriene um, receptor antagonist, like just try to add all of those on and see what happens. The chromalin, and I'm sure everyone in this group knows this, has to be like slowly um, up titrated. Otherwise, you can have people that have 
kind of pretty significant mast cell degranulation right away, a ton of symptoms, and then they're not compliant with it. Um, I don't time it with eating, which I think increases compliance. So I just space it out evenly throughout the day. Um, and um, I find that people are able to uh, be more um, compliant uh, with the dosing and getting regular doses in. Really great questions, everyone. Um, we have just about 10 minutes left. Is there anything else that you would like to ask Dr. Pace or our mentor panel? Do you recommend compounded chromalin? It depends on the, the person. Like if they don't tolerate the commercially available ones, then I will try compounding it. I'm probably going to slaughter this. Any comments on MALS or MALS in our hypermobile population? Yeah, um, I do think it's a common comorbid condition. I do think it's a neurogenic problem rather than a vascular problem. And, um, you know, I was trying surgical um, decompression of um, the celiac plexus um, with a local surgeon um, who could do it laparoscopically. And we actually were having pretty good results if you caught the, if you, if the time from symptom onset to, in, to surgical intervention was short, right? But what I found is that so many patients um, have had long standing, I think, complications from the median arcuate ligament kind of compressing the celiac ganglia, um, that you probably have a local inflammatory uh, reaction that needs to be addressed. And so, um, what I was starting to do, and it kind of got paused with COVID, was we want to actually do immune profiling of the celiac plexus, just a sample of it, and actually see if that gives us a therapeutic target that we could treat with an immune modulator rather than with surgery. Um, I definitely do not condone um, aggressive removal of the celiac um, ganglia. Um, I think it's a terrible idea. Um, there are a number of surgeons out there who report really incredible outcomes with that intervention. But I tell you, I manage more of their complications than they acknowledge exist. And um, there's a lot of complications. They're long-term um, and some of them are really, really terrible uh, to deal with. I just don't think that it's the right way. I think we really need to... Um, be thinking about this as sort of a neuroinflammatory piece, kind of like a complex regional pain syndrome. I wonder about neuromodulation. I, you know, I wonder about, um, you know, immune modulators. And I think we just need to start trying it in these patients because they're progressing and getting very, very sick. Dr. Brown? Um, any clinical trials that you recommend right now that people look into as well? There is like for the, you know, long COVID pot space, there is a clinical trial by Argenix um, that's looking at um, F gartigamod, which is an FC recycling drug to treat long COVID pots. That'll be kind of interesting if this is an IgG mediated antibody condition. Um, it'll be interesting to also test that drug in other types of conditions that we see in this patient population because there is a signal, even though we don't know exactly what the antibody is, that there may be uh, an upregulation of IgG antibodies. And so it may give us a good target, which is going to be much cleaner than immunoglobulin therapy that I just think is very, very dirty. Okay, a couple more real quick here. Um, do you try, do, wow. Do you try quercetin with any of your patients? You know, I usually go to chromalin first. If they fail kind of all my attempts at chromalin, I, I will try it, but I found that I can get most people to tolerate uh, chromalin. If someone comes into me on quercetin, I, I don't change it if they're doing well on it, but I just, um, I prefer formulations of drugs where I know what's in it um, because they're, um, there are a lot of things that are touted as natural that are extracted from plants, but if we don't do that extraction right, um, remember plants can't run, they produce a ton of chemical, chemical kind of compounds that we're, we're not necessarily supposed to be exposed to and can be reacting to. And so I really like to know what I'm giving my patients. Do you find that patients adapt to Linzess? Um, yeah, so I actually, my go-to motility drug is actually pyridostigmine, um, and then I will add on um, like Motegrity, which is uh, targeting the serotonin receptors. 
the reason I tend to avoid like Linzess or Lubiprostone is because they're secret gogs. And so a lot of these patients already are having trouble with intravascular volume. And so um, I think it can, um, uh, you know, kind of contribute to um, intravascular volume depletion. I will sometimes add them on. I'm not afraid to mix these drugs. They all have different mechanisms of action. And if they do help with motility, I'm perfectly fine um, to add them on. But my, my go-to drug would be pyridostigmine to start. Do you recommend other flavonoids such as lutalin? Yeah, that, you know, that's not something I'm really familiar with or have it, or use in my practice. Obviously, this is a very, very needed topic. So thank you so much for your time and to everyone for your wonderful questions.